Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. Welcome to my backyard. So why are we here? It's funny you should ask because I've been thinking a lot about creativity and artistry and how stepping outside of your comfort zone can feel so scary sometimes, especially when you're starting out. I totally get it, which is why I wanted to get out here, take a breather and offer you some fresh iced tea. No, what I'm really out here for is some fresh perspective. So let me ask you this. Do you sometimes feel a little stuck? Like you're doing the same thing over and over again, but can't seem to break the cycle. Or maybe your paintings are starting to look like everyone else's because you're following the same style, the same tutorials, the same techniques as everyone else. But does the thought of doing something bold and different kind of terrify you? I've got you. So this tutorial is gonna be a little bit different because I'm actually not gonna teach you how to paint today. What? No. Today is gonna to be about the first thing they teach you in art school. It's surprisingly not how to draw or how to shade or how to hold a paintbrush. It's actually how to see, how to think, and how to express yourself so you can start bringing in your own unique point of view and some fresh perspective. To demonstrate this, I wanna tackle a subject that has been done so many times by literally everyone on YouTube present company included. Florals. I know, I know, bear with me. Everyone, their mother, their first and second cousin removed has been painting florals recently. And that's exactly why it's the perfect subject to flex our new creative muscle and try to find a new angle. Here's the best part. Once you put these tips, these tricks, and this way of seeing and thinking into motion, you can apply this to everything that you do and you will immediately see that your artwork will get richer, more interesting, more one of a kind and more you. But don't you worry, if you thought this was gonna be a high stakes, intense art session, take a deep breath and relax because this is not gonna be like that. This is going to be failure free because there is no way that you can mess this up, which in my opinion is the best part. So to teach you this very special lesson, I'm gonna enlist the help of the maestro of innovation and of flowers, Miss Georgia O'Keefe. But first, let's get out of the sun and get back to the studio. Okay, you guess what time it is, art history time. Georgia O'Keeffe was an American painter who painted from 1910 to the 80s, and she was so revolutionary. She's widely recognized as being the grandmother of American modernism. So during a time where people were painting like this, she started painting like this. I know. She was like, uh, no, I'm gonna do me, and that's exactly what she did. They could tell you how they painted their landscape but they couldn't tell me to paint mine. Which, let me remind you, was not in 2023. This was 1913. We're talking Downton Abbey era, and she was painting stuff that looks like this. So she was constantly evolving and searching for new ways of doing things by playing with lines, abstraction, with colors and emotion to see just how far she could push things. She did everything from landscapes to skyscrapers, but what she really became famous for were her flower paintings. And instead of simply replicating flowers on canvas, she transformed them. She magnified them, she broke them apart, turning them into something powerful or sensitive or aggressive. Everything becoming more heightened, more, more intense. So how does that help us? Well, I didn't pick Georgia O'Keeffe at random, or simply because she painted cool flowers. I picked her because we're going to take something everyone has seen a bajillion times and make it new. Sounds like a tall order? Don't worry. Like I mentioned before, this is not a high stakes operation. I want you to think of what we're doing today as a creative sandbox. Let's play. Let's see what we can come up with. And if you don't like anything, it doesn't matter because it's all about the thought process today, not what actually makes it onto the page. First things first, let's find a subject. Going full on Georgia, 
Are we on a first name basis now? I bought a bouquet of oriental lilies this week. And if you don't want to do a flower, that's totally fine. You could grab basically anything that you have handy. A leaf, a spoon, a pair of scissors. It would be amazing if you had something you could hold in your hand. But if you don't, I'm gonna add some lily cam footage right here so you can take a screenshot if you want and have your own source material if you so choose. But like I said, a wonderful thing about painting from life is the fact that you can touch your subject, move it, hunt for unique features, like an odd bump, a funny looking curve, different angles, and maybe you'll start to discover that your inspiration isn't as boring as you first thought. And that's exactly what O'Keefe did, by the way. She had this magical ability to find the little personality traits of her subject and bring them out so even if she was doing a flower or a piece of fruit, it felt somehow like a portrait and you were peering into the soul of that object. Pretty existentialist, if you ask me. So let's put our Georgia hats on. And before sketching or doing anything, we're going to look at this flower. Really look. Let's look for the imperfections that it has. What are the colorations? Where do different colors begin and end? What are the shapes of these petals? And are they all the same? I bet you they aren't. And are there any torn petals or maybe a dark spot? Nothing in nature is perfect in the way that we think they are. My flower has some interesting curves on the edges of the petals, kind of like the dress on a flamenco dancer. I also noticed that the outer edges of the petal are very dark, but as you get closer to the center of the flower, it gets whiter and more green. The leaves are also really interesting because they can twist and create these wavy kind of shapes. So I'm gonna spend about five minutes or so just getting to know my object. It's kind of like speed dating. Who are you, Lily? And what makes you different from all the other flowers? Now, I encourage you to take out your sketchbook or a scrap piece of paper, the back of a receipt, some piece of junk you have lying around. We're gonna come up with some thumbnails, some rough ideas of how to put this lily on the page. So most people will start to paint this flower floating around in space like this perfectly centered and from a viewpoint that most people would find visually pleasing, visually appealing. Nothing wrong with it. It's lovely, it's pretty, it's safe, but maybe we can push ourselves a bit more, right? That's kind of the point of this video. But because it's so tempting and I wanna make sure that I can try to be as fearless as I wanna be, I'm just gonna go ahead and put the safe lily in the first box so I can get it out of my system. There. Done. No fear of missing out. Now we can truly, truly move on. So let's consider our options. And there are so many, my friends, so many more than you ever knew possible. There are two things that most people don't really think about when tackling their drawings that will immediately offer some differentiation to your art. Those things are scale and emotion. So most people associate scale with landscapes because that's where most people think it makes the most sense. And for emotion, most people associate emotion with people, portraits. But scale and emotion can be used really powerfully, especially on the most unassuming of things. What if, instead of this way, I had a worm's eye view underneath the flower, like I'm about to climb Mount Everest or this giant stalk, and it's this massive, nearly oppressive landmark. Kind of scary. Or what if I had a viewpoint where I'm sitting on a pedal like a little worker bee and we're about to feast on some seriously yummy pollen? Does that idea suddenly conjure up happy Willy Wonka feelings? I don't know. It's all about interpretation. So do you see where I'm going? Why settle for something we've seen a million times before when you could investigate a different viewpoint and maybe a different feeling too? So we don't have to be literal or even too crazy about it. I'm not trying to write a novel about this lily. I'm not trying to be melodramatic. I'm interested in giving it life. So it's not just a random lily, it's my lily. So right now I'm playing around with ideas. Nothing is going to be a masterpiece that I'm gonna keep. So I'm gonna go ahead and explore 
my wackiest ideas. And the same thing here will apply for scale and for composition. So what if the flower exploded off the page and it couldn't be contained by these four sides? Or what if we tucked it into the corner and most of our page was white? I bet you it would make someone lean in and ask you why you did that. Do you see how we're not just transcribing what's there? We're transforming it. And the best part about this is that how could you ever get this wrong? I mean, who is gonna come and bust you about your petals not being botanically accurate or your proportions or your shading being off because it is 100% a creation of your own imagination. So only you hold the key of what's right and wrong. You have unlocked that ability to see it as an artist. I find that very empowering and also kind of takes a whole like load of stress off. So speaking for myself, I'm going to look at this array of flowers that I've done a little bit differently and a couple jump out at me, but this one in particular I find interesting. The way the petals are cropped and the way that we can just get a hint of the center of the flower, like, like you wanna see what's on the other side, but you can't just yet. I don't know, I find it appealing and slightly mysterious. So I'm gonna go with that. In terms of the painting itself, I'm gonna be working with a limited palette. Taking inspiration from my Lily, I'm gonna go with a Hansa Yellow Light, Hansa Yellow Deep, Quinacridone Magenta, Perylene Violet, Sap Green, Davies Gray, Payne's Gray, and a lovely new turquoise I just bought. And this one um, is from Daniel Smith, and it's called Sleeping Beauty Turquoise, and it's made from ground up Sleeping Beauty Turquoise. <laughs> Pretty cool stuff. Go with whatever color palette floats your boat, and just like with our sketches, trust whatever it is you wanna put on this page at this very moment. You could follow along with me, or pick colors that just make you happy. All right, so first up, I'm gonna transfer my little thumbnail to my Saunders Waterford cold press paper. I'm not gonna be painstakingly true to this thumbnail. You can be if you want to, but I'm giving myself some leeway because I'm just relaxing, I'm having fun. I don't know about you, but I'm having a great time with you. Hope you are with me too. Let me know in the comments. So I'm gonna start working petal by petal. I love the idea of each petal being like a little mini painting, all of its own. And it also helps keep everything much more manageable and less overwhelming to go one piece at a time. And so that way it doesn't feel like you're juggling like seven or however many petals we're doing simultaneously. I'm gonna work on the biggest one in the middle first. So adding some water to my paper first and then dropping in touches of magenta and my perylene violet around the edges to get them to bleed like the edges of this petal. And a cool little trick is to take your paintbrush and drag that color down to the base of the petal, which helps give the petal the subtle details you'll see on a real flower. And so I might also try to bring in a touch of my Davy Gray faintly where the main vein of the petal runs up the middle and bring it down to the stem kind of made the stem thicker at the part where it meets the edge of the paper, which helps give it the illusion that it's coming towards you in this sort of dramatic sweeping perspective. So let's repeat that for each of the petals. And while I use this lily as a guide to inform what I'm doing, I'm also giving myself the liberty to do what I feel like doing. The key here again, interpretation. So maybe one petal is darker than the other because that's what I feel like doing. Or maybe I feel that my painting needs a more diagonal type composition and the colors will help me move your eye in that direction. So we can, we can play around here too. And I'm somewhat sticking with the rule of the pink getting darker as you reach the tip of each petal, but allowing myself some wiggle room to move within that too. And that's exactly what George O'Keefe did, by the way. Her paintings would suggest just natural references, and she studied her subjects very, very carefully, but what she ended up painting never really matched the real thing. All right, so moving right along, while the three largest petals I've done are drying, I'm gonna move on to the leaves. And this is probably the most exciting part for me because I find this twisty leaf thing to be so intriguing. So I'm gonna try and weave in a pop of color here, and what better way to do that than by picking a complementary color to lead your eye into this corner. 
So far, I've had a lot of pink on this paper. So what's the complementary color to pink and purple? Someone's been watching my color theory videos. You're right, yellow. Yellow is the complementary color of purple, and right next to it is green, which is the complementary of pink. So you guessed it, here we go. I'm alternating between my yellows, my sap green, and my turquoise green, and just look at that. It makes for such interesting moments to offset the pink of the flower. And I truly feel that no matter what color you chose, it's still gonna look spectacular. So if I went with a royal blue or even an orange, it would still look amazing. There's literally no way to mess this up, folks, and it's, it's just not possible. So one thing that makes it more interesting too is to make sure that not only that you switch things up in terms of color and hue, but trying to bring in lighter values and darker values. So it keeps the viewer on their toes, so to speak. So when I think about introducing values and darks and lights into a painting, I sometimes like to think of it as being like inflection in a sentence. So if I speak like this and I don't change my inflection at all and we just keep it the same way, it can get very, very boring. But when I have variations in my tones and pauses, it makes everything more engaging and less flat. And that's exactly the same thing with darker and lighter values. So introducing them will have you painting less like this and more like this, if that makes sense. <laughs> All right, so while that dries, let's come back to the innermost pebbles and fill those in now, since we don't have a risk of unwanted paint bleeding into neighboring petals. I'm also gonna add some softer neutrals, like my Davy Gray and my Payne's Gray in the negative spaces in between my petals and my leaves, and adding a couple of extra leaves in areas if I feel like I need a little extra something here or there. So while I do this, I wanted to circle back with you and see how you're feeling so far. Does it still seem scary? Or maybe you're looking at your page right now and not totally loving what you're doing. Here's where I'll give you another O'Keefe anecdote. Because there's often a misconception that these great artists had tons of confidence and knew exactly what they were doing at all times. And that was just not the case. Did you know that at the beginning of her art career, Georgia O'Keeffe was actually really shy about sharing any of her work with anyone. In fact, she was so self-conscious, a friend of hers took it upon herself to send one of her drawings to an art gallery. And the gallerist was so impressed, he arranged for a big exhibition in New York. And as they say, the rest is history. But she did not have the confidence earlier on. And thankfully for us though, her bestie came through. So thanks bestie. But yeah, nobody knows what they're doing, present company included. What we can hope for is to be open-minded and try out new things. Because what's the worst thing that could happen? Like the worst thing that could happen is you paint something you don't like. And if you don't like it, guess what? That's information. It's something that you can learn from so you can try things differently next time. It is not wasted time, my friend. I'm gonna bring some yellows into the stamen of this flower and we're just gonna get a little glimpse of them. They're kinda of hiding out here in the back like they're camera shy or something. I'm using my two yellows, the lighter one and the deeper one, to give me a range of yellows that'll give it more dimension. So now, my friend, it's all about filling in and painting in the rest of the negative space. I'm taking an opportunity to create a diagonal composition by emphasizing color in the corners and leading your eye up here but like I said earlier, there is no right or wrong way. So if you're following along with me and decide you wanna add a neon stripe or maybe a ladybug crawling up a stem, you have my full unwavering support. And if you're up to it, I would even try exploring the same subject multiple times. How many different ways can you remix the same object? And FYI, it's not uncommon for even the most famous of artists to explore a subject over and over again. You can see this in action if you enter any major museum. Monet doing a cathedral countless times during different times of the day. Or Leonardo da Vinci doing his Virgin on the Rocks many different times. Or remember the scream by Edvard Munch? He didn't do just one, he did several. So there's literally no shame in trying it multiple times. 
Okay, back to my little lily painting. I'm gonna to switch to my smaller brush to iron out and smooth out some of the edges a little bit. And I'm using a similar technique to what George O'Keefe did by defining my edges and contrasting the values to make areas pop and lead your eye upward. Is it working? The jury's still out on that, but it's fun putting myself in her shoes because there is so much to learn from these great painters of the past. I'm gonna wrap this up now, do a mental check-in with me. How do you feel? If anything, I hope it's given you permission to let go of the limitations and expectations you've set for yourself. Like I said at the beginning, this is playtime. So like a kid building a castle in a sandbox, it's time in the sun with a good friend. That's me, by the way. And even if you don't like your castle, I think it was time well spent, don't you? So I hope you enjoyed this video and that you learned something new, whether it's the art of Georgia O'Keeffe, or maybe it gave you the confidence um, of being able to add your own voice and your own point of view and perspective to your artwork. Because I think that the art world would be a lot richer and way more interesting if more artists like yourself added their own perspective and their own unique sensitivity to it. And if you enjoyed this video, I have another video that's inspired by another famous artist, Matisse, which I'm gonna link right here for you to check out if you wanna discover him and put into practice some of the principles of color theory but in a low-key, low-stress way. As always, thank you so much for watching and for joining me on these art videos. I appreciate you so much, and I will see you in the next one.